Um, so yeah, so that's me. So, but yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, and thank you all for coming and listening to me talk for rant for about an hour. <laughs> um, so that's me. If you want to follow me, that's my website and my Instagram. And I'm going to start with this piece because we all lived it, right? I mean, we all can relate to what happened in during this time. And so this is a piece that, uh, that I want to start with, or that I've been starting in, in my recent talks, because I feel like this particular, the way that I approach this body of work is, is how I'm approaching most of my pieces when I, in, in my practice. So, um, as, as you'll probably know and remember, um, this, um, particular newspaper, this day, it listed all the, 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 the casualties, or at least a 10% of the casualties up to that moment, uh, which were a, a thousand names, essentially. So what I did, um, you know, I was like living in New York City, so I got to experience the city in a way that I don't think ever will ever be experienced, which is completely empty. I was living in Staten Island, but after a month of being isolated, as we all were, I was just kind of going crazy in my own apartment in, in the neighborhood that I was living. So I decided to actually take a, a risk and I boarded the, the ferry and went into Manhattan because I felt like I needed to go out somewhere and kind of do exercise and, and just fresh air essentially in a place that I would, it would make me feel better uh, for my mental health. And so I was shocked to see the city completely empty. It was really, really an, in, an intense experience that I don't think I'll ever have. And so on during the, one of those days, I actually stole this newspaper because it was it had been delivered to a, a storefront that they were you know all they were all piled up and I knew I knew that this one in particular was uh, was there because I had seen the headline online I, I have the access uh, or I have the membership for the New York Times online so I knew that that was already been printed so I picked it up took it to my studio and I sit on it for a couple of weeks before I actually touched it. And that was because I knew that there was all these people that had lost their life due to COVID. And what impacted me about this particular story was that all of those names were essentially, even though they're visible, they were printed, they were not really legible. And so I wanted to highlight the fact that these people were missing, that we had lost these people. So I use erasure in my practice to highlight um, what's important. So I decided to erase all of those names, as you can see on this on these images, and I kept track of where how the names were actually labeled on the newspaper or, or how they were printed. Um, and then the final piece was essentially the the article itself without all of those names. It still has all the information for every single person. Uh, you wish you know some of them just listed what their occupation, some of them actually listed surviving family members or what they did in life. Um, but the names are no longer there. And I felt like that this is a good way for showing people, um, you know, the impact of what was happening, because I felt that by just looking, looking at all of the, all of the texts, the names and, and the numbers really just kind of got overblown and it was not, it wasn't visible. Um, another thing that I did is I actually, uh, one of the reasons I kept those names was because I wanted to bring them more individual, individuality, individuality highlight it even further so obviously we're, we're all using this type of face mask at the beginning and so i decided to just add those names to every, uh, a single mask and so i have all of those names with with those masks and then uh because i had cut out all of those names from the newspapers i knew as a printmaker that i could use it as a, as a stencil um and so i decided to just kind of do cyanotypes obviously i was limited to what i could do at the time because, you know, I didn't have access to a studio anymore. I was only in my apartment. So I decided to use that particular technique to, once again, kind of make copies of these, of these pieces. And again, this is something that I always do in my work, in that I take an idea and then I just kind of explore that same idea through multiple lenses, through multiple, multiple medias to find out which one is the one that's actually working. Or maybe the combination of all of them will be the ones that would be kind of working. So that was that series, series um, in 2020, which it kind of stands as an outlier right now because that's the only thing I've done, you know, when it comes to that subject matter. But like I said, conceptually and uh, technique-wise, I think it, it, it's the way that I approach my work in general. Um, as Kimberly said, I'm from Juarez, Mexico. So that's here on the bottom. The blue line is the river, the Rio Grande, and then El Paso, Texas is on, on the top. And it, we are sister cities, which means that we essentially 
we're next to each other. Like we're really literally the only thing that divides us is the, is the water, which is you know big. But we have a bridge that if there were no traffic or there were no custom agents, you know, within five minutes you're in a different country. And this is how I grew up. I I grew up going back and forth. I learned both cultures and languages. Uh, but all that changed in 2006. Unfortunately, uh, in 2006, at the end of that year, the then Mexican president decided to officially declare a war on drugs in Mexico. And Juarez being uh, so close to the border and being actually one of the main border towns for um, for ex- uh, inter- international exchange of, of products, we were hit very, uh, very hard with the violence. Now, the violence was already happening before, but this just kind of explode, made it explode. So all of a sudden, we were looking at scenes like this. Uh, the president had to send uh, federal police in like masses, drove masses to the city to basically patrol the city because the, the violence had spiked so much that it was just not enough for the local police. So this first series is based on, the, um, on a photograph that I saw in the newspaper, the local newspaper, um, that just kind of impacted me. And, and it, it's, it's the first photograph that I felt that I needed to make work about this subject matter. I mean, I had seen many, many photographs before that and read the articles, but this is the one that kind of drove me into making the work. And I'm skipping a few pieces within the series here, but you can kind of figure out what's happening. And then that's the final piece. Um, you can kind of imagine what would be the next piece if I were to do a, um, you know, another one. Um, this next image that I'm going to show you is just, it's going to be up for only a couple of seconds. And that's because I want you to see what it is that we were in the city, uh, citizens we were experiencing in Ciudad Juarez, uh, just to kind of get an idea. Um, so this is the type of images that we were looking at for multiple time, multiple times a day. Uh, every single day there would be at least five events, and that was on the low and the low end. So everybody in the city was exposed directly to the violence. So um, I'm gonna kind of like explain a little bit for my for uh, the way that I did that that previous series of work, and then the next ones that I'm doing because it's important. So I'm using a laser engraver uh, to basically burn cardboard with a machine. So the machine is, is, is creating my image through a laser that is burning that cardboard and creating a, creating a layer of soot on the surface of the paper. Now, this is important because I am trying to connect the subject matter with the technique. Um, I'm using connections between the processes and the idea so that the, the, fi- the finished product is, is, is more, you know, is stronger, essentially. So what happens, the, the, the image on the top does after the machine it basically draws my image and then at the at the bottom i take it to my studio and i use selectively uh, using an exact knife selectively take some pieces out to be able to create uh, different embossment areas and to kind of highlight you know a contrast between more black and and, and gray tones when i was making this work i was actually looking at um francisco goya um Otto dix and other people like leon Gallup. Uh, to just kind of get inspired, and to specifically these two artists, Goya and, and Otto Dix, because they were printmakers and they were also using the printmaking medium to talk not only about, you know, something as, as, as horrible as war, but because they were using the medium itself to kind of highlight the ideas, you know, using assets to, to create those decaying flesh effects. Um, so that's kind of where I was trying to, again, conceptually tie my work with, uh, with the images. Uh, I mean, with the process, the idea with the process. So these are some of the pieces. And all of these pieces come from photographs that were actually published by the newspaper, the local newspaper in Juarez. Now, um, unfortunately, these images are very easy to see now in in this digital form. When you see them in person, they're actually much more abstract. Uh, I think because of the scaling down and because of the digital aspect of it, the image kind of becomes a little clearer, at least in my impression. I might be wrong. This is something that I will never be able to do. I can never see these pieces the way that you are experiencing them because I know the original source image. And so whenever I see these pieces, I see the actual photograph. So I decided to strip away all the color, all the basically details and make them into these abstractions because what I wanted to do was to actually lure the viewer through beauty essentially so that they would get close to these pieces and experience them that way and then over time, the image would reveal to it, uh, itself to the, to the audience. And then when you have that moment of, of realization, then you will understand what it is that you're actually looking at. 
And I was fortunate enough that it did work the way that I intended because when I've seen exhibited these pieces, people see the work and they're really attracted to them. Like they re get really close, right, to figure out what's happening. Remember all the coloration, all the tones, it's just burned suit uh, or that suit, that burned residue that is impr imprinted onto the paper. So they're, they're kind of trying to figure out the technique in a way, but then they see the cadaver or they see what the image is and they don't stop looking, uh, they don't look away. They don't stop looking at the image, which is exactly what I wanted. They actually start inspecting it even further. Sorry to yeah. Are these? these are full sheets, so they're twenty-two by thirty. So they're not they're not humongous, but they're they're decent size. They're bigger than the screen. Mm-hmm. Actually, they're about the size of the whole screen if they were to like you know expand to that size. So after doing that body work for a while, um, you know, I got I kind of got a little bit burnt out with the process, and also with you know looking at all of those images. So uh, I had an opportunity to have a, to have an exhibition in Austin, and I decided to create an installation using the newspapers that I, where I was collecting um, or where I was pulling all the images. Now, this uh, uh, this uh, particular installation came out of um, my experience feeling really burned down and kind of weighted by all of these images and all of these stories that were that I was reading constantly to. to you know, for as research from for my images, and there was a point when I was still living in Juarez. Um, I lived through uh, the, some of the, few, the the first few years of the drug wars, and some of the more intense ones actually. And so during that time, I was actually collecting the newspaper in my room. Um, it started to look like a like a horror's room because I just had piles of newspapers that I couldn't. I haven't. I hadn't even gone through all of them because you know there were just so many that um, I I just couldn't keep up. So. When this uh, opportunity came up, I decided I'm going to make an installation where I'm going to put those actual newspapers. But then I also created this uh, mold uh, so they could cast uh, a stack of newspapers uh, in, in concrete so they would be actually heavy. And so part of the idea for this installation is that I put some the, or the actual newspaper in between some of those uh, concrete stacks and the visitors had to actually move those stacks so that they could actually uh, reach the newspaper. So, because I told the museum that um, and to encourage all the visitors to do that. So, that, and if they wanted to take the newspaper or if they wanted to take a stack itself, that they were more than welcome to do it. And I was fortunate enough that people did take take me up on it. Um, I came to visit the exhibition because I was living in Austin at the time still, and uh, so I visited a couple of times. And the configuration of the installation changed every time that I went to see it. So that meant that it was very, um, you know, people really did. Um, did what, what I expected them to do. And this was in a way for me to kind of, I mean, I was uh, at the time getting ready to move out of Austin. And, and so not that I was trying to like get rid of my, you know, possessions because I didn't, I wanted to travel light, but it was just kind of like more of, of like emptying, you know, my mind of what I was feeling because I felt like I, I, it felt, I felt so heavy and I, I wanted the visitors or the audience to feel that heaviness physically in, in how I'm, in how I was, you know, perceiving it. Uh, this is a Mexican artist, uh, Teresa Margolles, and this is an actual wall that she purchased from a, a, a home in Culiacán, where she's from. And this is where, in front of it, there was a shootout, essentially. And so those are the remains of the shootout. And, and you can see some of the numbers from the forensics where they were you know, kind of like doing, doing their job. So she bought this uh, wall from, uh, from the owners of the house. To, and she's been traveling around the world to highlight, you know, and, and pay a, put attention into the violence in Mexico. So after seeing that piece and a few other, you know, things that I was happening, that I was looking at and researching at the time, I came with this idea of using a hand drill to recreate portraits. So, um, you know, uh, like I do as an artist, I always want to keep myself entertained. And so I try to change processes because once I start doing something too many, too much, I just kind of get bored, um, even if the idea is, you know, still driving me. If the if the process becomes monotonous, then I feel like I'm not doing justice to the idea. So this was one of those moments where I needed to, to switch and do something different. Um, so what I decided to do for this one is I decided to concentrate on the portrait of those people. So before I was doing abstractions of those images, and the reason that I was doing the abstractions was because I was thinking of how those were memories for all of us who were living in Juarez that we didn't want to remember. But you can't really forget everything completely. Something kind of lingers always in our memory. And there's something that will spark, um, you know, that 
that emotion or that scene and it'll come back to you but it won't be exactly the same it will be more of an abstraction of what you saw and so that was kind of the idea for that previous body of work for this one i wanted to be a little bit more literal and more visual so like i said i constrained on, on the actual portraits and i decided to make them actually big pieces so these are 38 inches by 50 inches tall uh, so they're really large. And because of that, and because the images were coming out of the newspapers, the pixelation kind of got enhanced. So that gave me the idea that I actually, I wanted to erase these people. I wanted to erase the violence from these people's life because they went, they were, they were taken out of this life, you know, through a violent method. And so I felt that if I erase them, then I'm cleansing them in a way I get, you know, going back to this idea of using erasure, not as a destructive form, but more as a, as a cleansing. Um, so what I did is I put together a stack of sheets of paper, white, black, as you can see, and then I was using a, um, a drywall as a backing to be able to hand drill one half ton at a time using different uh, size drill bits. And interestingly enough, the, the drywall piece is the one that actually received most of the violence and the one that actually got decayed. The paper is actually a lot stronger than I expected it. If I'm being honest, these pieces at the beginning, I was thinking of them more um, performance uh, like than actual physical pieces because I really thought that the paper was going to be completely destroyed and I was not going to have anything in the end and it's interesting enough that actually it was the opposite the papers held up and the backing is the one that I ended up getting destroyed um, one of the reasons that I decided to do a stack of paper is because I wanted to have multiples always kind of thinking as a printmaker but also because I knew that then I would I could use some of those stencils once I figured out that the paper was going to hold and recreate the portrait. So I'm erasing it to cleanse the violence, but then I'm recreating the portrait, hopefully bringing it back to life in a better way. Now I'm using um, cup, metallic copper enamel paint to recreate the portrait. The reason for this is because there is, um, there is a saying in Spanish or in Mexico that is the equivalent of uh, showing your true colors. And so if you translate that saying literally to English, it says you're taking out the copper. And Hispanic people, Mexican people, uh, specifically, we're told that we have copper tone or brass tone skin. So again, conceptually, I'm thinking, you know, I'm bringing that idea of the copper tone skin into this portrait. So making it specific that this is somebody from Mexico. Um, because obviously my work, I feel like it can, it can work uh, in a more broadly, it can be about any war essentially, but I do want to have it a little bit, give it a little bit of specificity, but also this idea of like you're showing the true colors. So who is he? Was he a cartel member? Was he an innocent bystander? Was he a policeman uh, or an officer of, of the military police? And you don't know, and I won't tell you because I'm not judging these people. What I'm trying to do is highlight the fact that we're losing generations of young men specifically, or more specifically, in Mexico because of this violence. So I, I'm not anybody to judge why they chose that life if they were cartel members. And I don't want you to judge either. Like, I don't want you to come into my work, see one of these portraits, and then read that he was a cartel member, and then be like, okay, I don't care for this person because he was a bad guy. That's not about it. He was still a human being. He was still somebody's father, brother, you know, cousin. Um, so this is uh, just a studio shot of how I kind of made the work. Uh, you can see the different stacks of paper. And then this is just the installation shots of uh, how I show the work in different, how I've shown the work in different places. Um, that copper place, uh, copper piece, ideally, I actually want to do it on site. So um, I have done them on, on black paper that I can actually sometimes ship. But if I have the opportunity, I actually want to um, paint a wall in the gallery and then create that piece uh, so that it's temporary so that it lives during the, the, the exhibition time but then at the end it'll it'll be erased again just as you know like this the lives of these people unfortunately uh, happen and then again also part of the why i made multiples it is is because it allows me to do installations similar to this now this one they're all obviously different portraits or uh, different people uh, but i've been able to do use multiples to be able to create larger installations uh, this is a larger piece that I did from um, uh, one of the surviving members, uh, family members, um, and it's one of few that I've done so far, but it's something that I'm starting to do more now, uh, or I'm going to be doing more in the future. And then this is also an, a larger piece, which was, this was the second time that I did a full figure. I, I concentrated on portraits at the beginning, but then eventually I started um, branched out into making actually full figures. 
So that's just the PVS scale on, on that particular piece. Um, and then this is the largest piece I've done so far. So this is just the studio shot for when I was making, I had to do it in tiles, obviously, because this is the final piece and you can see that it's pretty large. So that's uh, eight feet by 16 feet, um, each panel. Um, so I was fortunate enough that I had the space to show it and uh, it was a you know lar large enough well, uh, well space that I could that it could be displayed. So I'm really happy that um, and, I, and if I'm being honest, I wish I could do more of these pieces, but I kind of limit myself because I kind of know that I don't have, unfortunately, just yet the ability access to gallery spaces that large. Um, so kind of switching gears a little bit. So all of the all of those pieces, you know, I consider them I consider them as prints, but they're not traditional printmaking or they're not traditional prints. But during, there was a time when Flatbed Press in Austin, Texas, invited me to come and collaborate with them, and they wanted to publish my work, essentially. And so I knew that I could just basically use the same technique and actually make blocks that would be more straightforward and additionable in, in, an, easy, in, in, a, in an easier way. I was not interested in making additions. Um, so those pieces that I showed earlier, there are, there are multiple uh, copies of each piece, of each portrait, but they're kind of different because they're not done in a, in a traditional way. Um, so anyway, in Austin, uh, I decided to do two, two woodcuts. Those, those were the first two that I may, I've ever made um, using this particular technique. But I was kind of getting to the point of that technique where I was kind of getting tired of it. So I, I told them, well, can I try something different? And if it works, if it doesn't work, at least we'll have the two woodcuts. Uh, fortunately, they were game. They were more than up for it. So what, what I did is, I decided to do the same technique, but on copper, and then add aquatine to it. So it, um, it was it was a little bit more elaborate. It was going to give me different textures and different tones. So uh, these are just kind of process shots of what, what we were doing. The problem with that for me was that I ended up having to do that portrait three different times because I needed to do stencils for blocking out some of the areas to be able to create the different 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 gray uh, gray tones. So it was more hard work on myself which I, I, I didn't really realize until I was actually making the piece. Uh, but fortunately, they print, they edition it for me rather than me editioning it myself. So that's when we were pulling the, proof, the first proof. And then that was the final piece, which I want to keep making more of these pieces. I'm really excited for how they look and, and what else they brought into the portraits. But I just haven't had the time um, or the place to be able to go do that because I want to keep them large. These are the same size as those original uh, portraits, uh, handrail portraits, because I want to keep them all um, you know, um, in the same line or in the same, um, in the same pattern, basically. Um, so I know I could do them smaller, but then that kind of defuses the purpose. Uh, one thing that also happened when I left Juarez, so I left because I needed to go do, do my master's. And then after that, I needed to get a job. So I kind of never went back home other than to visit my mom or to visit family and friends. And it was actually interesting. So after the first semester of being away, I left uh, to Austin, Texas to start my master's, like I said. And so a few months after when the semester ended, I came back. My mom picked me up in the airport in El Paso, and then we drove to Juarez. And this is 2010, which is when the city was at the highest of, of, of the violence. Um, and I remember coming into Juarez, and I remember asking my mom, uh, she's like, what happened to the city? Like, it, it, it looks so different to me. And I couldn't understand why. And she just turned around and told me, like, what are you talking about? The, the city is exactly as you left it, uh, as you went, when, you, when you left. And that's when I realized that we had essentially created self-imposed prisons in our own houses. We were not going out anymore um, to enjoy social, quote unquote, social life. We were not going to restaurants. We were not going to the movie theaters. We were just basically going out to work, buy groceries, and then come back home. And that's, uh, so we increase our security. So I don't know if you can see all the um, electric uh, fencing on, on top of the roof. You can see the razor wire everywhere. And, and all this was done when I was there. I was still living in the city, but for some reason it didn't register. I just had chilled myself in, in ignoring it because we needed to continue and have a purposeful life, a happy life, even though we were living in this violent um, city. and so. Having that distance opened my eyes and I realized that. So I came back to the city and I did this series of photographs where um, I'm just highlighting, you know, this particular objects that 
nowhere else in the world have I've seen. I mean, all of those spikes, they're all over the, the roof. I mean, where in, the, where in the world can you say that you would see that uh, or that you would find that? And that's still there. Like uh, all of this just kind of stayed. This is obviously more than 10 years ago now. And unfortunately, all of that is happening. Um, a lot of these houses are actually close to where my mom li- used to live or where I grew up. Um, and I, so I've been back and I still see them exactly the same. Uh, other things that people did is they closed streets. They created like, um, you know, DIY gated communities. And again, this was out of necessity because there were shootouts. People would just drive out in front of a stop in front of a house and they just riddle it with bullets. Uh, just like that, um, um, that wall that I showed earlier from Teresa Margoyes. So what the uh, neighbors had to do is like they created these gated communities so there will be only one entrance and one exit point to, into the community. Uh, so they put all of this and, you know, this is illegal, by the way, like the government didn't approve this and they never told us anything because they just couldn't do anything. I mean, they were not doing anything to stop the violence. But what, again, what did we do? We had to live happily. So come Christmas time, we had to decorate it. <laughs> Feliz Navidad, you know, Merry Christmas. And so that's that's kind of like the joke about it, right? Um, so um, this is more recent work, which is actually right now uh, being shown in Portugal at a graphic biennial, graphic printmaking biennial. Uh, so this is a new series that I'm starting where I'm kind of concentrating now on the people left behind. I've been concentrating on the cadaver uh, or the people that have, you know lost their life. And I feel like as I said, I need to look at the uh, at the problem or at the subject matter from different perspectives, because I, I don't know if, if any of it is working, or maybe the collection of all of them is going to be work is going to work better. So uh, what I did is I went back again to those original photographs or sources that I had, and I'm editing the body out, and then I'm just concentrating on the forensic teams and the um, uh, the family members. So this is a series that is just all done in Aquatint. That's all it is. There's no, there's no line work. And then the idea for this series is that I want to have enough where all of them are going to be connected by that police line. And the idea is that wherever I show this body of work, it'll go through the whole space and it'll essentially encircle the visitors. So when you come into the space, you will be inside that crime scene and you'll be looking out essentially. Um, so that's, uh, it's still in progress. I have 10, 10 pieces, but this fall I have another residency where I'm going to be expanding on this particular work. These are small, uh, they're nine by nine by 12 image size. Uh, and I wanted them intimate because I want people to actually get close to them and look at them, you know, more closely. Um, okay. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, unfortunately I lost my mom in 2020, 2019. Um, and that was a shock because it came out of nowhere. Unfortunately, she had a heart attack and well, at least, uh, it was heart failure. We don't know if it was a heart attack, but essentially she just didn't survive. She had had a couple of episodes in the past. So she, we knew that she had heart failures. Um, um, but anyway, so, uh, she passed away. I went back home, uh, to my, to my brother, you know, with their, the, the, we put her, uh, you know, with it, what needs to be done, I guess, and then came back uh, to school. And then unfortunately the next year, you know, COVID happened. So I couldn't go back home anymore after that. So it took me about a year and a half before I could go back. And so during that whole time, uh, I was just thinking about her passing. And, uh, excuse me, I wanted to do work about her because it was something that I was already thinking. Uh, during this time, she was unfortunately working less, not by choice, but rather because her employers were giving her less hours. And I remember at the time I was trying to come up with a project where she could do something for me that I could then do work with. Um, unfortunately, I could never tell her. So that was difficult. But... When I was able to go back home to my brother, to the house, um, going through her things, because we didn't go through her things during that first initial visit, I found all of these doilies that she had created uh, throughout her life. Um, and so that's when I realized I could actually do this project because she left me all of these things, essentially. So these, uh, these were the first pieces that I made where 
I'm just playing formally with those shapes and, and, and those textures using cyanotype because I went home. I didn't have a studio in, in Juarez. It was just my you know regular house. So um, I kind of worked uh, with the, with what I had and made those sort of as sketches. Um, and then these are more uh, refined pieces where it's actually the cyanotype and then my mom's piece in front of it. Um, this actually come from my recent exhibition that I had earlier this year. Um, so this is kind of what I'm thinking now. Uh, so at the time I was thinking that, you know, this was work that I needed to do for myself, not, not as a grieving process. I, I do want to clarify that, but more as a conversation with her, because this is what I was planning is, is a collaboration between the two of us. And, and I'm just really happy making this work. So, um, I was invited again by Austin, by Flatbed Press in Austin, Texas. And I went and we did this series of, uh, lithographs, color lithographs where we essentially try to, uh, or I try to replicate these pieces, these crocheted pieces, one-to-one -one scale, almost exact colors to how they are. And again, I'm looking at these pieces in a formal way um, because of the way that she passed away. And unfortunately, the same way that my, pa my dad passed away many years before uh, through heart attack, I am kind of seeing, or, it's, or in a way, kind of assigning, um, these ideas to these uh, forms, I see them as cell structures. Um, you know, mathematically, everything in, in life is, you know, ends up in, in some mathematical equation. And so I feel like that's that's how, my, how I'm approaching or how I'm looking at these pieces. Uh, this is a little bit different though. And this is, I think, is a portrait of my mom. This piece, I found it exactly that way in that when I found that it, it was half, half finished or half undone, however you want to see it. Um, and I feel like, and unfortunately, it represents her life in that she, you know, she was taken from this life without without finishing, you know, what she needed to do, at least in my perspective. Um, so it's a body work that I'm continuing to do and explore. Uh, I found also, obviously, uh, all of her um, medical uh, documents. So these x-rays, you know, she had her first episode in 2000, 2009. And so since then, up until 2020, 20, 10 years later, 2019, when she passed away, she had been going to the doctors, the cardiologists, actually to check up on, on her health and all of this. Um, just um, she collected all of this. Um, the doctors gave her all the x-rays. And so when I found them, I felt like this is literally my mom. So when I was making this work, um, I knew that I needed to bring her in, you know, not physically, but in a way. So that's kind of that's why I'm using this juxtaposition of her body, and then these doily pieces that she created. And the way that I'm approaching it is that those doilies, you know, she created them with love. It, they were something that I grew up looking, seeing in the house, basically all the time. You know, they were on on top of the di dinner table or or uh, nightstands. You know, and they were they're meant to like make the house more more homey, more approachable, something. So the way that I'm seeing them here is that they're trying to mend that body. They're trying to mend those bones. They're trying to heal her in a way. Uh, the color obviously comes from this idea of the, you know, the, the blood, the vessels. Um, and it's, it's sort of like a, a strange idea of trying to heal the body through these objects because obviously it's not going to happen, which is kind of you know, the way that I feel, the way that I, my powerlessness, you know, how I'm feeling of not being able to save her life, even though she was going to the doctor and doing everything that she needed to do. And actually, this is more of a side note, but um, she was actually doing really great with her heart. The cardiologist had told her recently before she passed away that she didn't have to come as often anymore because she was actually just doing so well that she didn't, she didn't have to do, come. And after she passed away, uh, he told us, he approached me and my brother during the, the, at the funeral, and he told us that he went back to his records to see if he missed something. And he's like, your mom was just doing really well. He said, these things just unfortunately just happen. The, the heart gives up when it wants to give up. Give up. Um, so last year, I was fortunate enough that I was invited by um, the Morgan Conservatory. It's a paper making space where um, I could come and explore and do something. So I brought um, the doilies themselves and I created this mono prints in a way. Uh, so it is abstracting even further now those images, which I'm, I'm really enjoying what this is doing for the, for these pieces. 
is kind of is is concentrating more on the, the that mathematical pattern that I'm talking about, and these are still kind of like ideas that I'm thinking. It's a new body of work, so not everything is kind of fleshed out yet. But like I said earlier, I'm really excited and really happy of making this body of work. Um, it's 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 also sad, but it's not as sad as as you know one might think of actually, because I feel like when I'm making the work, I'm connecting with her, um, you know, in, in through the afterlife, I guess. Now these pieces I also did last last summer, and this was these were not done using the doilies that she created, and this is because I had a residency in in Italy that Kimberly mentioned in in Venice. And so I came in with a plan to that residency. I was going to make a series of line of cuts using elephants that I'll come back and explain why. And then when I was there, unfortunately, my my plan failed completely. So all of a sudden, I had to do something uh, on the spot without any, I'm not knowing what to do, essentially. And I was going to be there for a month. So I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Fortunately, there's an island in Venice called Burano where lace is... Uh, a big thing there. I mean, it's kind of one of the, probably one of the birth uh, spaces for lace. So they told me, you should go check out that museum. You know, it's a beautiful island. It's very small. Go check out the museum, go check out the lace, and maybe that'll give you some ideas. So Burano is also known for their bright colored houses because a long time ago when the, it was a fisherman's ha um, island, and so when the fisher fishermen wanted to come back home at the end of the day, at the end of the day they wanted to see their house from afar as an incentive to just kind of get home, essentially. So as you all know, Venice is all public transportation, is all boats. So I'm approaching Venice, uh, Burano on this boat, and I'm seeing all these houses that are brightly colored, which basically reminds me of Mexico, because there's actually the same tones and colors that Mexico uses for, Mexican uses for painting their houses. And then once I get to the, to the island, I walk to the town square, and they have a huge Italian flag, which is the same as Mexican flag, except for not having the emblem in the, in the middle. So I'm like, I, I'm feeling weird because it's like I feel like I'm coming to Mexico, to my home country, but I know I'm in Italy. Uh, and then I go into the museum, and they have these beautiful pieces that are also just kind of remind me of home and remind me of my mom. So I decide to buy a few of those doilies, and then I created uh, this series with this idea of thinking of home. And thinking of my mom as well so they're not connected directly to her but it is still about her and it is still about this idea of home um because it just it just brought all these uh, emotions and all these memories you know i they flooded back um by looking at all of this so um these are just some of the examples so going back to the elephant uh she collected elephants it was her favorite animal and so she had a, a large collection of elephant figurines ceramic figurines, um, and which now I obviously my brother and I inherited, and there's over 200. Uh, most of them are small, but she had, she did have a couple that are like this tall, uh, which are more kind of like planter bases, I guess, or for doing coffee stands, essentially. So, I mean, I was, you know, culpable of give, gifting her a lot of those elephants. <laughs> Everybody, every time she would have a birthday or celebration, you know, people would give her an elephant or something elephant related. So again, when I went back home and I, I documented all these doilies or I grabbed all of those doilies, I documented the, 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 the elephants and I created this video uh, or I, it, this is also in progress. So I'm going to shut up for a minute because you guys need to hear the sound. So right now it's just looping. It's only two two elephants, uh, but this is kind of like the the idea. This is a long term project that I have. My idea is to actually use all of those elephants that I documented, and then they'll be uh, changing in size as well. Um, and the sound that you're hearing right now is obviously of a, of a heart, which is not my heartbeat. But eventually, that's what I want it to be. Uh, I want to record my own heartbeat while I'm doing different things so that my heartbeat is not constant as, as it is right now on the animation, but more that it will fluctuate. Uh, and then that fluctuation or that tempo will be the one that will define 
the tempo for the rotation of the elephants. Uh, I'm also, I don't want to use just the photographs because I feel like that's too easy. Um, so I'm kind of processing those elephants in making something out of them first and then documenting those uh, those pieces and then incorporating them into the into the animation. So the project that I'm actually doing here is going to be part of this as well. And I'll show you at the end what I, what I have planned. So this is just an installation shot of my exhibition, my recent exhibition. It just it closed in mid-March of this year. Um, so you can see, you know, some of the pieces. And then one th thing that I, I failed to mention when I was talking about those paper pieces, which are these ones, is that they kind of act like uh, watermarks. So because of the process of making those pieces, there's more paper pulp in certain areas than others. And so when you have a light underneath or behind it, it really glows and it shows the pieces in uh, with more detail. So what I did for the exhibition, I created these stands where uh, they they were about this high, and so you had to look down, which kind of brought you know again this idea of them being kind of like you know centerpieces for the dinner table or for nightstands, because obviously everything else is on the walls in a more you know I guess gallery uh, setting in presentation. Um, I decided to bring color, obviously, in, into the work, as you've been seeing, as opposed to my previous body of work, which is something that I'm also kind of very excited about. Um, and so, yeah, so that that's, that's this is just when, when the opening was happening, just to give you a sense. And then I'm going to finish up with this with this uh, work, and I'll, I'll talk about it a lot, uh, fast because I know I'm running out of time. But so I was invited to uh, Germany. This is back in 2015 or 16, I can't remember now. But I was invited specifically to this place called Penemunde, which is on the northeast of Germany and in, in, in an island that actually Germany owns. And this is the birthplace of um, rocket, rocket technology. So during the World War II era, uh, Werner von Braun, who ended up in, at NASA after the war, this was basically his research laboratory. Um, he was at the time developing rockets, unfortunately not to send people to the moon, but more to uh, bomb the Allies, obviously. Uh, this was actually the power plant, so that power plant ended up becoming uh, a museum, a history museum. And so an artist, uh, in, another artist, a Spanish artist, invited me to come and do a residency during, during that summer. And I have no connection to Germany. Um, I mean, well, I do now. <clears throat> but back then, I didn't. I didn't have a connection. I have no family. I, you know, so and I have no connection to World War II either. Like none of my family, you know, um, served on the on the war. So when I was invited to this residency, I didn't know what to do, to be honest, because I didn't want to come in and do something that was not about the history of that space, because it just kind of felt wrong. And so I read a lot. I learned a lot about Bernard von Braun and this space. And these are just is the photoshops of the photos of the installation, just to kind of give you an idea. It's a former power plant, and like I said, they have it open as, as a history. And they should they give you the history of essentially World War II, but specifically for the the creation of the rockets. And then it actually ends up with you know sending people on, to the moon. Uh, so they do have that as part of it. So anyway, so I decided, well, I'm going to try to see if I can capture the essence of the space. And so using I created images based on those structures that I saw. So um, again, going back to the laser cutter or laser engraver, I used it to basically create te uh, templates. And then it was uh, the power plant was powered by coal, and they still have a, a lot of the coal on site. So I use ground it up, and then that's what I was using for pigments. I also burned wood from the area and then created ashes, and then that's what, how I made it. I made these pieces. I did essentially used those stencils to create. Um, to create the pieces through, but then by doing that, the those pigments ended up also getting stuck to the stencil, which I also kind of like, which is why I made them into pieces. Um, I found random things all over the place, and I just basically use anything and everything to kind of transfer those marks or those colors into paper. So that's me processing, and then that's kind of like the finished piece. Um, I used the dirt and you know debris that was all over, and then using spray enamel to create a stencils that then I would use for cyanotypes, uh, kind of like the way that I'm showing here, and then those are the final pieces. So those were the stencils, which ended up becoming pieces, and that was kind of the plan at the beginning. That's a different one. And then this is a cyanotype. So for those pieces, I was thinking about how the cyanotypes are essentially like blue map, uh, blueprints 
and but they kind of have like this aerial view effect because of the way that I used um, created the stencils. And so I was thinking, kind of putting myself in that in that time and how it would feel to be in that place working, um, and then hearing all these you know planes from the Allies trying to bombard the place. Because once they found out, obviously they were bombarding them because they wanted to stop this project, uh, which fortunately they did. Otherwise, we would be speaking German. Um, <laughs> so this is the final installation that I did at the museum. At the end of the of the summer, we had an exhibition with the work that we we created, um, and that's a better shot actually. Um, and then uh, they had some of the windows, original window displays, and because it is a history museum and it is. Um, the government government funded they have to show have it on display so i asked if i could use them um uh, as stands for my work and they said yes so i created these pieces and again i'm kind of i was kind of thinking like what it would feel like living be, working in this power plant and then also hearing and seeing these explosions outside because they fail a lot of their projects failed they their rockets would explode every time because they just didn't have the, the science nailed down yet um, and through my research, like I learned that there was a lot of explosions when they would fail. So I was thinking, like, what it would feel for those workers being there and then just kind of hearing and and feeling those, uh, you know, the, the rumbling of the earth at the time. They were using slaves. Slaves, um, you know, they they did have a camp. It was not um, a death camp, quote unquote, because they're still actually um, they're not entirely sure. But you know, they say that they they were not. They were treated better, which I don't know what that means. Um, and then this is just the work being shown in a more traditional setting of a, of a gallery space. And out of this, uh, we were actually fortunate to publish a book, uh, a catalog. So it's a pretty good catalog because it has um, essays from two art historians that uh, talk about the history, uh, one historian and one art historian. So it talks about it, the history of the space, the history of World War II in that particular project. Um, and then also just about us, the artists. Um, this is Gregorio Iglesias Mayo, he's a Spanish artist who invited me. And then obviously myself on the other side. Um, you can find it on Amazon if you're interested. And that's it, I'm gonna finish it there. Thank you. So yeah. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I know I gave a lot of information. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, I guess, when, when your process gets monotonous, how does that reinforce or continue to reinforce Yeah. Um, I don't know how it enforces, but it, I'm always aware of it. So I, I, I looked at, a, I've, I've seen thousands of images, obviously, of crime scenes. And I realized also that there's a, there's only so many ways that the body can fall. And so there's times when I'm looking at a photograph and I'm reminded of another uh, crime scene from a different period even because of because it just looks almost the same. So it kind of brings it back also into this idea of the multiple or printmaking and that it's, it's this repeating patterns essentially, which kind of become the monotony. And so when I'm making the work, I do try to focus on that particular image and try to forget all the other ones. So that I'm, so that I'm being, I'm doing justice to that particular person. Um, I think for me the monotony comes more through the process. In that, when I start feeling like I'm just doing things without thinking anymore, or that my mind starts to wander somewhere else, that's when I realize that I, or that's when I know that I need to change gears and I need to try change uh, mediums or just try something different because th then I know that I could could I could continue doing that for years. But then I'm just not, it feels like I'm not caring enough anymore. Um, but that only happens through the processes, not so much with the images. Like I said, I see them and the multiplicity of the images look, looking similarly. 
but I try, I don't let it affect me, I guess, in in making me feel like, oh, it's the same, so I'm not going to use this one. If that, I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. Hmm? Anyone else? Yeah. That, yeah. That context is really lovely. The, one of the things that struck me when you said about the COVID lockdowns, mm -hmm. but also that um, when I have people are like locking themselves down. Right. And it, it just seemed like a real parallel. Um, That's interesting. I, I had made that connection. Thank you. Because that happened way before COVID. Yeah. I mean, that that lockdown that we imposed ourselves in, in Mexico, in Juarez, that was, you know, 20, I would say it's roughly 2017, 18. So 20, 2016 to 2018, Ciudad Juarez was the most dangerous city, most dangerous city in the world. Um, and then it came back again later on, but... It's not anymore, fortunately. Uh, that doesn't mean that the violence is gone. I mean, it's still there, it's just not to, to the levels from those years. Uh, but yeah, I, I do now kind of, I'm starting to remember more during those first years when everybody was starting to put, like I said, the razor wire and then the electric fencing. You know, so you had like the normal, you know, fence on your house and then you add to it and then you keep adding and keep adding. Um, yeah, I mean, it really did feel that way. And I have a niece and a nephew that they were very young when, when, the, uh, when the drug wars exploded. And I feel like their experiences, you know, they grew up differently than how I grew up. I mean, I was fortunate enough that I, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, late Gen Xer. And so I grew up outside on the streets, <laughs> um, going to friends and just kind of doing whatever I wanted. I know my niece and nephew, they, if they, went to their friends, they would go to other people's houses or somewhere in clothes. They were not really playing outside like we did. And, you know, that, that I still think about that sometimes because it's, it's a different world that they experience, um, which now the rest of the world can kind of <coughs> connect with, especially all of those kids, you know, all the COVID babies, all the COVID kids. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Uh, you have a question back there? Yeah. No, yeah, no. That's a great question. And I'm going to be honest, I don't, it's, it never influenced me before. I think it's, I'm, but I think it's because I was not allowing it to happen because I was, you know, this body of work is the, my mom, the, the one about my mom, I've been doing that work for the last roughly two and a half years, two and a half, three years. Um, but before that, I was concentrating on doing the violence in Mexico. And so I've been doing a lot of residencies, fortunately, over the years. And every time I go, I would go somewhere, I was just concentrating on making work about that body of work. So the, the place and the area didn't really inform the work. They did inform me as a person, though. So whenever I go somewhere, I take advantage of exploring the area or the city as much as I can. So like I, I try, I try to divide my time where I spend half of the time in the studio making work. And then the other half, just going out there, going to restaurants or going on hikes or walks, uh, because I like, I like, I like it. I love traveling. And so that's kind of what I do, but like I said, I never allowed myself to do that. The experience in Italy that I was forced to do that. Because otherwise, I don't, I don't know what I would have been able to do, to be honest. So I feel like that's the first time that I've been letting it, letting it happen and influence me directly into my work. I was doing the same thing where I was exploring. I feel that I walked every single street in Venice. I really feel that I did. Because every time I would go to the studio, every day I would go a different path and I would come back also a different path because I wanted to experience the city. Um, that didn't what came into the work. It came into my personal experience, but 
the city itself did come, Burano came into the work. Um, to go back, to answer your question about it here, it's not, it's not happening, unfortunately, maybe. Um, th this is what I'm doing uh, for, this, uh, for this residency. This is the sketch. So uh, it's gonna be a triptych, um, 22 by 30, each sheet. Each one is gonna have four elephants. And that's the full rotation for the elephant. So once I'm, I, I'm going to scan them, and then once I put them together for the for the animation, it'll do the full rotation. Um, the, all of these colors. Oh, I didn't bring it. I was going to bring it. Um, one another thing that I found in my mom's uh, belongings was like a friendship uh, bracelet that somebody gifted her uh, that has her name, and so it has. It is exactly those colors. That's exactly how it is. Except that it has her name in this middle one. But I didn't want to have her name. I, I felt that it it just wasn't necessary. Um, and because when I was doing the schematics for this piece and doing those those colors, I realized also that this kind of reminds me of how you would see how sometimes DNA is kind of shown like through this sort of like colors, you know, or bands of, you know, different things. And so I felt like if 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 it has her name, it's gonna have a different connotation. And I'm thinking a lot about my own mortality now, obviously, um, as well. And so I am thinking about who I am, where I'm coming from, and also just like what am I predisposed to? Obviously, I'm, unfortunately, I feel like I know how I'm gonna go. Both my dad and my mom went through a heart attack, so I mean, <laughs> most likely that's how I'm gonna go. I think. Um, so yeah, so that's um, so yeah. The, this space hasn't come in into play. I've been having a lot of fun. I've been walking all around the area, uh, but yeah, it's not coming into the work. Yeah, but uh, but I'm open to it though because I, I I really enjoyed what happened in Venice, and I think I'm gonna try to let it happen because that's what happened also in Germany, and that was before that. Obviously, there's another project that I didn't show. And I've been thinking of including it because I've never actually talked about that one. And that was in in Hawaii. That was a, that's a residency that I did also a few years ago. And that's also something that I wanted to try something different. I was kind of feeling burned down of the of the drug wars work, and so I came in. It was a one week residency, so it was very short, very fast. First time being in Kauai specifically, the island of Kauai. So that body work, um, actually, oh, I don't have internet. Um, I made using plants and colors from the area, but I never talked about it because I felt like it was just something weird for me at the time. Now I feel like it fits because now I feel like my, my work is more varied and I need to talk about it more because I, now I'm also thinking about it because at the time I realized that what I did in, in Kauai was more about life, about celebrating life in a way. And that's because at the time, like I said, I was being feeling burned down of all the research that I have been doing for the for the drug wars. This was before my mom passed away, obviously. So now I'm talking about life in a different way as well. But I feel like I need to bring that also. It was very colorful as well, which now it is. Before it wasn't. So so it has, but not as much. Yeah. That was a long answer. <laughs> um, anyone else? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, one thing I forgot, uh, I always try to take a picture of the crowd. So uh, I'm just going to do that now. I'm trying to uh, archive my talks this way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it pays off <laughs> to be on the front row. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm around if you still want to have a conversation. Yeah. I'm here until Monday. I leave on Monday. Yeah, going back to New York and then flying to Berlin. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, my partner lives there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I have plans for travel while I'm there too, doing research and yeah. So I'm assuming all this kind of industry is uh, the flights 
wearing? Yes, these ones were. Uh, these were photo plates uh, or polyester plates. Okay. Uh, the first time I am, I've done them actually. Okay. So I'm glad that everything kind of is working out as I planned. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. He's been yeah. really huge help. Yeah. 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 When you do the pieces with the base on the joint, it's mm -hmm. the original joining um, get destroyed with the wrists. No, I'm doing it in a way that they I don't want them to be destroyed. Yeah. And actually, I was trying to not use them too directly, but at the same time, I felt like they needed to be used directly. So after the Morgan, when I was doing the work in, at the Morgan, they started getting stained because of the pigments in the in the paper pulp. And at first I was trying to like wash it away immediately so that it wouldn't get changed. But now I'm embracing it because I, I remember that, like I said, this was, I was, I wanted to make a project that my mom and I would collaborate and they work together in a way. And if she would still be alive right now and we were doing that, I would not be caring for what she would have made. I would be doing all kinds of things to those things and not caring if they get destroyed or not. So now I feel like I have to allow that to happen. It's life. We're all temporary. And so I'm going to be gone. So why should these pieces, you know, last? I, if they inform the work, I think, why not? Uh, so I'm more open to it. I'm still not abusing them too much, but gradually I'm getting there. Yeah. 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 And fortunately, for some of them, actually, I have copies because she would make, I guess they would, you know, you would make sets. So like for some of them, I have like three or four of the same one. So I'm only using one and kind of saving the other three. Uh, that one's that. Like that. That one's yeah. That, that one I'm not gonna say. That one I'm not gonna touch. But see, like that one, I have another one that is exactly the same, and it, it was finished. So I don't know why she never finished that one. I'm guessing maybe, maybe it was the first one that she was learning that particular, you know, or maybe it was the pair. But but why? I mean, I'm wondering why she never finished that second one though. Was she one? No, it was it was uh, it was old. I kind of know that it's old. Yeah, because she left she left a couple of pieces unfinished, which I have, and I that one those ones I haven't actually touched. I, like I documented them, but I left them exactly as she left them on the back. Um, yeah. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. That yeah. she finished wine, she's like, "That's all I need." Because yeah. you know, a lot of the times I know she would do something just to learn the, I don't know what it's called, like the points of how to make it. But then she would never do anything with that. Like she would just make it to learn, and she's like, "Okay, I know how to do this." And then she would apply it to another piece, you know, that she would then make. So that's what I'm guessing. Yeah. No, there's there all types. I've been told that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of symbolism that I need to now start making research, and then that will also come into the work. Yeah.